Welcome to the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Hometown Ticketing is proud to be the exclusive sponsor of the UIAAA Connection Podcast and to provide schools nationwide with the best options for digital ticketing for their events. Visit their website at hometownticketing.com to learn how they can make digital ticketing possible and simple at your school. Thank you to Hometown Ticketing for their exclusive sponsorship of the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the UIAAA Connection. I'm your host, Mark Hutch Hunter. Today, we're pleased to have as our guest, Tal Gropp, certified athlete, certified master athletic administrator and member of the NIAAA Board of Directors. Welcome to the podcast, Tal. Thanks, Hutch. Happy to be here. Let's have you begin by sharing with our group here in Utah and across the nation where you grew up, where you went to college, your first job, those types of things. Yeah, born and raised right here in Boise, Idaho. Um, you know, growing up in Boise, and then eventually I went to Boise High School, uh, where I graduated in 1992. Uh, I have three older brothers, so, you know, it was a fight just to get dinner, usually. <laughs> and and then I, eventually I had a younger sister. She's nine years younger than me, but you know, they were very active in sports and kind of helped shape me and follow that path. And I, my oldest brother is 12 years older. So, you know, I was just a little kid running around the gym or, or the football field following him and, and seeing what he was doing. And so it's one of those things where my dad grew up as a farmer. So he, he instilled in us a, a sense of hard work and that we can get anything done if we, if we really want to. And, and uh, so those things kind of helped me decide that, you know, I, I think as a young kid, I always knew that if I wanted something, I had to work for it mm -hmm. and that, uh, that I could do anything if I really wanted to. And, you know, I, I was blessed and happy to, to have a family that really cared and supported for one another. So, um, yeah, pretty lucky. I, I, when I was in high school, Tracy Linen, who some of you may know, she was one of the, she was not the AD yet, but she was one of the PE teachers at my school. And, and so, uh, and then, of course, she's been a, a nice mentor of mine over the years here in Idaho. So things are going great. Excellent. Let's talk for a minute about the driveway battles with your brothers in one on one basketball. And yeah. did, did you ever get to the point where you could beat them or were they always just beating up on you as little as a brother? Yeah. So being, being the youngest boy um, and being quite a few years younger, <laughs> they'd be playing in the in the in the driveway, I'd come out to try and play with them. And then they just throw like my ball or something on the roof. I'd go around the back of the house because that's how you get on the roof. I'd get up there. By the time I got there, they jumped up and pulled it down. So uh, they were brutal to me, which I think only toughened me up. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, of course, I, I'm able to beat all of them. There was a point in which <laughs> I could beat all of them. When I was, when I was, a uh, oh, I, I think a, an eighth grader, I, I put a three point line in my driveway. And um, we had an eight foot hoop on the side and a 10 foot hoop on the, on the garage. And so I developed a, a, a three on three tournament in the summer and I invited a bunch of people and we had a tournament in my driveway. And so little did I know at that point that I'd be organizing a lot of tournaments over the years, but uh, uh, it started when I was an eighth grader in high school, having a three on three tournament in my front driveway. Your first job was an AD. I like it. That's right. That's right. Let's talk for a moment about some of the youth sports, act, uh, not activities, but sports that you played up in Boise and uh, experiences that you had growing up and then getting into high school. Yeah, as you know, like there was no clubs back when I was in, in school. We just, we just played on our own all summer long and, and uh, tried to get better at whatever sport we were doing, football, basketball, track. Uh, those were the three main things that I was involved in and it evolved to the point where I was mostly just doing basketball. And then in high school, you know, our coaches had summer camps. Uh, we went to Alaska one year and played in a tournament um, my, between my junior and senior year. And so they, they provided great experiences where we'd go down to Lake Tahoe every year in the summer and, and just try and get better by playing better competition. And, and um, I really feel like, you know, it's changed a lot. You know, you and I have seen how, the club scene has kind of taken over in the off season and, and kind of been what the off season is, but those clubs really don't provide 
the same sort of um, experience that we can offer at the high school, the sense of team camaraderie, being a part of something that's bigger than yourself, uh, not caring if you score or not. You know, it's like I, I've witnessed a lot of this because I have kids now that go through some of those things. And, and so the experiences that we still try to provide our student athletes is far superior than anything they can get outside. And for me, you know, just this path coming up, uh, being involved in sports really just kind of helped develop me into, um, you know, the person that I am today. Uh, I think it's the biggest bang for the buck, um, you know, that schools don't put a ton of money into our programs, but they probably get the most out of our programs. Kids get so much more life experience in their after school activities than they do during the day. Oh, there's no question. I think you mentioned club sports and the clubs aren't interested in your kid. They're interested in the check that you bring them. That's right. So, so they can make their money. Let me follow up <clears throat> just quickly. You said you got to go to Alaska when you're in high school. So where in Alaska, Anchorage, did you know, or. Yeah. So we went into Anchorage and uh, we, we tried to go fishing while we were there, but none of us caught anything, but you know, it was one of those experiences where we, we stayed in the, in the high school and we slept on cots in the classrooms and, and then just played basketball right there. But um you know, it was one of those really cool things that we got to fly. I'd never been in a plane before, you know, and so we got to fly up there and, and um, it was a really cool experience. So, and then of course, those times when you're traveling with your teammates is where you really get to bond and get to know each other and make lifelong friendships. And, you know, I've got those friendships still today, not as close as we were then, but anytime we see each other, it's almost as if we've just returned back to high school. Sure. Let's talk for a moment about some of the mentors you had growing up, some of your coaches, people in the community, obviously maybe your parents. Share that with our audience. Yeah, for sure. My, my dad obviously is my number one mentor. He's the one who, you know, was always there. Uh, he taught me, the, like I said earlier, about the, how important it was to work hard. Um, he's one of those guys who never bought anything new. He just fixed everything. And, um, you know, that's one of those things that I didn't realize you, you could just go replace things. My dad just fixed everything. <laughs> so, you know, my kids call me the fixer upper and I'm nowhere near what he was, but, uh, but he was one of those guys that, um, you know, there was never a moment where I came home and said, Hey, my coach is being a jerk or I don't trust him or th that, that was never even a conversation. Like, you know, you just trusted your coaches and did what they said. And, and, um, my dad fully supported any coach that I ever had. Um, I had a coach my sophomore year who eventually was the head coach here at, the, at Timberline High School. He was my sophomore basketball coach. And so when I graduated from college in 2000, a job opened up here, a math teaching job. And he went straight down to the principal and said, we've got to get this guy in our school. And he made it happen. You know, that's what uh, those great coaches of, of ours that we've had in the past really stepped out of their comfort zone and made sure that things happened for those kids that they that they coached. And he was one of those kind of people. He's still a, a friend of mine. He coaches golf. He's retired, long retired, but he coaches golf at uh, Mount View High School, a, a crosstown school here. And and uh, so we run into each other once in a while. And so I just really appreciated Coach Gary Larson and his leadership for me. Perfect. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> What's your biggest failure or disappointment? And what did you learn from it? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, to be honest, I've been pretty lucky with a lot of things I go for. I, I um, am able to accomplish. And, but, I, you know, I will say that there are times when, as a young coach, I don't think I fully understood what was going on around me. I, I wanted what I want now. And... I think through through experience and time, you realize that um, patience is one of those things that you don't have when you're young, or maybe I didn't at least, and that now I, I fully understand and, and appreciate what that what patience can do for a young coach, for myself and and those in whom I'm mentoring now. And and so I don't know if it was so much a, a failure, but as as much as just a learning experience as I grew through time that um, it's important to recognize the path that we're on and really try and enjoy it and not try and get to that end result. I, I guess the one, the one piece that um, I'll share with you is that I applied to be a head basketball coach. I thought that was my path. Like 
I was never anticipating being an athletic director. I thought it would always be a head basketball coach. And I applied for the head job at, at Boise High School. I'd only been in, in education for six years. I was at Timberline. And no, actually, it was only five years that I was in education. I applied for the job at Boise High. I felt like I was a good candidate and I didn't get it. And, it, you know, it hurt at the time. But I was young. Like, I didn't realize how young I was. And so the next year, the position, the basketball position opened at Timberland High School. I applied, did not get it. A month later, the AD job opened and I said, what the heck, let's give it a shot. And so it changed the trajectory. Like, that's a failure, but it's one of those things which turned the course of my, my career path into what I feel like is a much better path. Like doing what I'm doing now as athletic director, I feel it, like I can connect with and and mold and, and work through a lot more kids, student athletes and coaches than I ever would have maybe as just a, a head boys basketball coach. That's well said. Let's talk for a moment about the job of athletic director and how it has changed since you first got the job. And that's got to be what, 14, 15 years ago? To, Pretty good to guess. Where it is now. Yeah, so this is my 16th year as AD at this school. And and I've been lucky and fortunate to be at the same school the entire time. Uh, yeah, there's a lot that's changed, I think. Um, we mentioned club sports. We mentioned social media. Uh, there's a lot of things that I am constantly dealing with, you know, our website, updating it, uh, making sure that communication is prevalent in those areas in which I didn't necessarily have to do when I first started 16 years ago. Um, of course, we had computers and we had websites, but it was very early on in what we were dealing with. I find now that I have to train coaches on how to deal with social media. I never had to deal with that before, right? Like, I just met with a brand new coach here today and I said, look, you are now wearing Timberline on your forehead all the time. So be careful what you do with social media, with what you're doing outside, with these selfies that you take. Uh, because now you are representing our school and everything that you do. And that's something that is a young coach, like we didn't have to worry about, you know, when it first started, they had to worry about where they were, but it wasn't about what they posted. And that's a term I never even had to think of before. And then when you think about club, when you think about club sports and what they've done to our kids, there's a lot of good from it. I'm not going to say that they're all bad. I think they do give a lot of skills that uh, these kids need, but we have to also realize those situations with all of our kids and try and make, make sure that as we mold them into the student athletes with, that we want in our school, that they are following, you know, being better people, not just better athletes. That's kind of the PCA model, right? We're, we're about developing better athletes, of course, but then also better people through the life skills that we give them. Now, I like how you said that because I'm, I'm 100% with you. The clubs aren't concerned about developing better people. The clubs are concerned about, like I said earlier, give me your check for your kid and B, we want to beat everybody. And we don't want to beat everybody. We want to beat everybody by 40 or 50 points, that right. type of. So that's well said. Speak for a moment about your journey with the Idaho Athletic Directors Association. And then, of course, your journey with the NIAAA. Yeah. So... I couldn't tell you how many years ago it was, but I met with uh, one of the IAAA board members at a national conference. And um, I said, you know, I'd really like to get more involved. And I, I think you and I talked before this podcast about how our state association on some levels has, it's hard to get into. There's people that stay on it for quite a long time. And so just so happened that there was an opening and they were willing to give me a chance, some, a, a young guy. And, um, I think I mentioned this too. Tracy Lyon was a mentor of mine and somebody that, that I worked with in our school district. She was a crosstown AD, you know, at Boise High School. And, and um, so when I came on the board, as is also always the case with a lot of these kind of positions, is I just tried to figure out what my role was going to be. But it's evolved to the point where um, currently I'm the president of the I, IAAA and, and, um, and that evolved into being the selection from the Section 8 on the NIAAA. And I think it's just helped me kind of step out of realizing everything that we do at my high school. I can also have an impact with ADs across the state and across 
the country. Um, and it's not necessarily because I do a better job than anybody else. It's because, um, it's because I'm willing to share and learn from others. And that's all that we do in these organizations is share what we do and learn from others what they do. And by doing that, we become better at our job in, in impacting student athletes and coaches um, in our jobs. And I, I always feel like I'm the little fish in a big pond in every one of these meetings I go to. Um, and, and I'll always feel that way, no matter what position I ever hold. And that's because I value what ADs have to give. And we have great ADs all over this state. Some of them get more involved than others. Um, and then, of, of course, through the NIAAA as well. Uh, I, I'll transition to the national system as well in, in that I took a chance and signed up for being on a committee. And Ed Lockwood called me and asked me to be on the certification committee, a, a stint in which I was there for about eight years, <clears throat> served as the vice chair for a number of years, went out to Indianapolis and was able to meet some people there and <clears throat> in the summer months and, and work with Sherry Stice and, and Pete Chambeau and, and really kind of helped develop the certification portion of the NIAAA. And I think that that opened up doors in just developing relationships with people like yourself and those around this, this country that, um, like I said before, are really good at their job and are willing to share what they do. And, and that has helped me to understand how I can also do the same thing. And uh, I, I attended my first NIAAA board meeting just uh, last month. And, you know, it's, it's kind of eye-opening because there's so much uh, to do in a short amount of time. And there are some great people doing that volunteer work. And, and uh, it, it's been just a, a pleasure to be a part of it. Let me follow up and have you talk for a moment about the NIAAA family. And this has been a favorite question of mine to quite a few of my guests that I've had on the show, but it's hard for me to describe it to people in Utah or around the country because they look at you like you're kind of crazy. Like, well, that, that you don't really have those kind of connections. That doesn't really happen. But of course you and I know it does. So speak for a moment about the blessing it is to become involved at the NIAAA and becoming part of that family. Yeah, I, I kind of use this analogy. I, I'm a runner and for a while there, I, I like to do like distance marathon. I don't love marathon, but I've done it. And I also did some triathlons for a while. And there's these little jokes all the time about, you know, these runners and these triathletes, how they get up at 5 a.m. to train and do these things. And, and why do you do this? Why do you beat up on your body? And I use that analogy with ADs who actually volunteer and get involved. We don't get paid. We extra, you know, for, for doing any of these volunteer works at the, at the national and, and uh, or the state level. But what I found is that I gain so much more than I give by, by volunteering, by giving of my time. Because I learn a lot from those and people that I am volunteering for. But I also feel like um, I just get that recharge of my batteries in what I'm trying to do in my job so that I can help people find success in their job. And, I, and it's hard to explain, like you said, because as I do that, I, I create connections across the country that I know I could call at any moment and they would help me with any problem I have. Um, and that, that came through the... PDA, Professional Development Academy, which I attend in, in September. And that comes through the certification committee and those connections that we made um, to be able to say that you have friends in New York or Florida or Texas or North Dakota or Utah or, you know, all over these places in which I've never necessarily been is pretty amazing. But um, it's also a tribute to what the NAAA offers. And that organization being the volunteer organization that it is helps all of us become better at our jobs, but that's not the main purpose. It's so that we could also really connect with one another and develop a community that we know we can trust and be a part of at any moment. It's fantastic. Let me follow up and have you just spend just a few minutes talking about, I know you were on in the leadership of the certification committee with Pete, as we talked about earlier, Dr. Jake, who's also been a guest on my, on my podcast, but talk about how great 
<clears throat> that experience was just working with the rest of the committee and, and that leadership. Yeah, my first time to Indianapolis um, for the summer session in which is the first time I actually met Pete. There was a lunch at downstairs and um, I didn't know anybody really. Like I talked to, to Ed, I'd seen him at the certification committee meeting and I knew Sherry just briefly, but um, it's really when you get down into the nuts and bolts of what you're trying to do that you get to know people and you're stuck in, our, in those offices for eight hours a day and uh, you laugh and you make fun of each other and um, but you also just have a lot of fun getting to know one another and I think being a part of that group really helped me to see um, that I can contribute as a person and as an athletic director, and then also as somebody who wants to try and mentor and bring others along. Um, so I, I just really loved the experience. I felt like, you know, a lot of listeners here are going to know Pete Chambeau because he's just one of those people that connects with everybody the first time he meets them. And he's friendly with everybody. And that kind of friendship is rare. It's not always that you find somebody that's that easy to get along with with anybody but also somebody that you feel like he's your best friend so it's really kind of cool no i i agree 100 percent. why don't you share some of the successes successes that you've had being a state coordinator in the idaho group i know you've talked about <clears throat> your time in september and quite a few septembers but share some of the successes you've had with being a coordinator with your people in idaho and then of course in the september meeting that we have yeah, our state's unique that um, it's got a north section, east, and, and a central uh, section. And so, and we have a lot of really small schools in which there sometimes can be a high turnover of athletic directors. So what we've tried to do is really develop a sense of um, community within our own state, which isn't easy to do because there's such diversity. And one of those things that we're trying currently, it's not fully developed is to develop this uh, mentorship program. And we followed Washington in what they have been able to do. And we're trying to develop and grow that mentorship program. And I think by doing so, just by initially right now, what we're trying to do is make sure that every member of our board connects with all of the new ADs in their region. And they, they try to do that on a monthly basis and, and then reach out to them and, and see what they can do to help them out. So that's been one of the successes that I think that we've had. It's growing. It's not fully developed, but I think as it does, then we'll see that ADs will be able to stay longer because that's ultimately our goal, right? To, to not have turnover so that people know what they're doing for a longer right. period of time um, and not having to, to train them up every year. The second part to that is uh, we're really trying to put push in our state uh, folks to get their CAA and their CMAA. And again, that's a struggle. But we've developed programs at our, our state conference in which we can at least inform and try to push those young ADs into that, um, into that program. Reflect on your time on the NIAAA board. I realize you mentioned earlier you've only been to the one meeting that just uh, finished here a few weeks ago. But and you said it was an eye opener, so I want you to maybe expand on that answer because yeah. I had heard before I got on the board what it was like, and I had imagined what it was like. But until you're in that room, surrounded by all these great leaders across the nation, it doesn't really quite hit you. So I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, no, that's great. So you get a packet from Phil and Mike. And, and then Mike McGurk, the current president, you get packets from them. And now it's not, I think maybe when you were on the board, they actually sent you hard copies. They don't send hard copies. Right. It's all digital. It's all uh, digital now. Yeah, so they give you a link to the packet. And when I open the packet and I see that there's, um, you know, like 40 different sections. And within oh, so each of those sections, there's probably another 10 documents. So you're yeah. looking on some of them. Some there's only two or three, but like, you know, you're talking 150 possible documents that you're reviewing before you even get to the board meeting. And so that's the eye opener piece, right? Um, do you have to memorize it all or read it all? Probably not. You can review a lot of it while you're there. But, um, and then, you know, taking that a step further, uh, 
you get into this room where there's these amazing people from all over the country, somebody from each section, president, past president, president elect, secretary, and then of course, Phil and Mike, who are amazing people um, in the room. And, and so you start out just by observing, but I think, I think that they are so good at being inclusive, no matter what year you are or what moment you are in the, in the room, that you feel like you can be a tribute an attributing uh, member from the very moment that you start. And that's that great feeling of camaraderie that they, they provide. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're at, what your level is, you're part of this board member, uh, part of this board as a member, and we want you to contribute from the moment you walk in the room. And, and so that's one of those feelings that is just amazing, right? And so um, for those who are looking to possibly have a chance to do this, I fully support you doing that because I, again, I've only been in one meeting, but I feel like those people in that room are my, my closest friends. Um, I'll share with you, you one experience from my first board meeting, something that a lot of you did, you know, who have been on the board never, never got to experience. And I can say this now because it's all been announced, right? So Mike McGurk tells us that Mike Blackburn is retiring in a year. Right. Right. So that's something that was a shock to us, but also the way it was handled was quick and succinct and Mike followed the pop manual and said, this is what we've got to do. An interview was made with the administrative team with Phil Risen to see if he was interested and wanted to take over that position. It was done quickly and perfectly. And, you know, I can say this now because it's all been announced. Phil is going to be the new executive director when Mike um, leaves. And that's to be able to witness how it, took place and how we were all included in the process was amazing. Um, and something that is, a, you know, an attribute of who Mike and Phil are, but also about who the president is and what his role is in that situation to make sure that everything's followed correctly. And then of course the pop manual is got everything laid out. So you know exactly sure. what's supposed to be done. Yeah. No, you mentioned, I, I, let me ask you, let me go back. Do you remember the days of leadership training when you would get your leadership training manuals but they were in the green binders oh yeah okay well yeah i've, I've got one over there on my on my yeah. wall over there and then they evolved into the booklets that we've had most recently right. yeah yeah i don't have the green binders anymore i've got the information that's inside the green binders <laughs> yeah they're on my bookshelf but I, I i go back to what you mentioned about the packet because when i was on the board we would get a a brand new it was white and it had, you know, board meeting, July, whatever board meeting, right. February, and it would have 26 tabs and it would have all these documents. And so, yeah, just in the past, what, 10 years since I've been on the board, everything is digital and it is so much easier. So, well, I'll tell you this, that. I'll tell you this too, like the office staff has changed over the last year or two, right? So you've got right. maybe even the last five years, but a lot of young office staff who are very tech savvy and they've developed programs which help the NIAAA move in a more succinct and efficient way. And it, it's, a, it was amazing to watch. Um, there's nothing against what has been done in the past. It's just a shift in, in how it's being done. Right. And there'll be a shift I'm sure um, as Mike leaves us in a year from now, and then there's going to be obviously a process to pick a new person. I assume they'll probably start in July work with the two of them and uh, then it'll just be the two of them in January and <clears throat> I, I look at all the changes just in the NIAAA in the past five years the past 10 years the past 15 and so it's exciting it's exciting for someone like you who's on the board that is going to be part of these new things that are coming out so that is excellent share with us your observations about the recent conference in Denver and about how great that was getting back. And I, I know everyone has said this, but it had been two long years since most of us had been able to see anybody. So I think that added to it, but uh, share your thoughts about the conference with our listeners. You know that old adage that uh, you don't know what you got till it's gone? Yeah. And uh, that was so true to this conference because when we were virtual the year before, um, it, it was nice to have some of those classes, but it was nothing like being in person and being able to talk to people face to face and have interaction with people um, 
in person was so phenomenal after the year and a half of COVID situations that we've had to go through. And so I just so much, I, I guess I appreciated it much more. I'll, I guess I'll never forget Denver, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I remember a lot about all of the conferences I've been to for different reasons, but they kind of blend together um, mm -hmm. in my mind. You know, a lot of them to come together and, except for certain situations. And so I couldn't even tell you some of the moments where I was at. But I think I'll always remember Denver just because of this situation and how it was. Um, now, was I bummed that we didn't get to go to Tampa? Because I wanted yeah. warm weather, of course. Yeah. But, um, but I really, I really enjoyed this conference um, for those very reasons that we've talked about. I think um, it also helped me appreciate what we do at the NIAAA um, to be able to have LTA, LTC classes, but also workshops and also those breakout sessions where we're able to really come together and talk about key issues that we need to hear and discuss and see what's going on around the country because we don't necessarily know what we don't know until we're there in that per in that place together to figure it out. What's the favorite part about being athletic director at Timberline High School? Yeah, okay. Well, that changes every year, Hutch, for me. I would say yeah. right now, um, my son is a junior in high school. And so the, my favorite part of being an athletic director right now is having my son here. Sure. And being able to watch him play soccer he was on the state championship soccer team. He was part of basketball this year. And, um, you know, it, it's been fun to, to be on that journey with him. Um, he typically comes and has lunch with me, which he just walked by. And I said, go away. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> so, uh, but it's been great to have him here with me. I will say in general, the greatest part of my job is being able to work with coaches and athletes because um, they are phenomenal people. And I, I feel just blessed and lucky to have such great, great people that I get to be a part of. And I've never told a coach that they work for me. I always tell them we work together. And our job is to, to come together to figure out the best way to give a good experience to our student athletes so that they can leave here as better people and enjoy the experience while they were at Timberline High School. I also preface that by saying, I know this isn't going to work for every kid because they have different expectations of what we can provide. But right. ultimately, that's our goal together to create a, a situation where they have a good experience. Thank you for sharing that. Let's finish up with a couple of questions. The first one would be, if you're going to give two pieces of advice for a brand new athletic director, and you were to tell them you absolutely need to do these two things in order to be a success at your job, what would those two things be? Yeah, so, man, I wish I could give them like 20 things, but the two things, here's- Okay, the I'll, let, I'll let you go three. Yeah, okay. All you're right. in a neighboring okay. state. Okay, <laughs> all right. I will say the first is make sure you find somebody that can be your mentor. And it, and it doesn't have to be called a mentor. It just has to be somebody you trust that you can reach out to who is in your area as an athletic director that you can trust to answer your questions. Now it's not, I know it's hard for a new AD to try and get that done. And so it really is on, on the existing older ADs to reach out to them, but don't do it alone. Like it's impossible to do this job by yourself. So you've got to reach out to your friendly ADs. You've also got to make sure that you delegate in that process. And I, that's kind of two things in one, but I think that they're so important um, to realize that you cannot do this by yourself because you'll burn out. Like you will burn out. And that's why we have a high turnover rate of ADs because they don't follow that simple advice in getting help. Um, and, I, and I know it's different at each school. Some schools have secretaries, some don't. Some have assistant athletic directors, some don't. Some are teaching classes, you know, some are not. And so whatever it is that you need to get additional help, make sure that you do that. Um, I, and then I will say that you've got to find balance. Uh, you cannot just put aside all of your own personal hobbies and pleasures and what you like to do on your own, because again, you will not last in this job. So you've got to find balance somehow in your life so that you can still spend time with your family, um, do some of the personal things that you like to do and, um, and get out of your office feeling like you've done enough for that day. 
so that you can enjoy some of those other things. There will be days when you're here from 6 a.m. till 11 p.m. Oh, yes. No doubt about it. But you can still find balance in other ways. I know for me, like having three boys that um, came through, it was really important that I had my wife and my kids come down to be with me. And that's one thing that we can do in our job is we can have our, our families be with us here. I don't know that that's enough, but that is a piece of it that I think was very helpful in my process um, to make sure that I, I could still game manage, but still have my family close by. Very good. Tal, what questions should I have asked you that I failed to ask you? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Hutch, like this is great avenue just to kind of chat and talk and listen to what other ADs are doing. Um, I think at some point, and I, I don't know if this is a question you should ask me. I'm just going to throw it out there. But how can we, as ADs and people in our, in our regions, improve our state association and improve our, our national association? And I don't know, I don't have the answers, but I think it's something we should be constantly asking. What is it from each of the people out there, what is it that we could suggest to make our organizations better so that they reach more people and that they provide more for more people? And again, I don't know that I have the answer, but I think it's something that we should always be asking. That's a great point. I'll throw I'll throw Big Rich uh, into this conversation, who you know very well. But I, I think when I had him on the show, and this is last year, 40 or 50 episodes ago, he, he said something to the effect, it was when I decided to become a giver rather than just a taker. And that's when it changed for him with the UIAAA and the NIAAA. And I think maybe that fits into what you were saying. Yeah, that's a very great comment. Appreciate it. So that, <clears throat> that does it for another edition of the UI AAA Connection. Once again, our guest today has been Tal Grop, CMAA Athletic Director at Timberline High School and current member of the NIAAA Board of Directors. Tal, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure, Hutch. Good to see you. For our listeners, we hope you tune in again next week for another edition of the UI AAA Connection.